All right, so our first demonstration is going to involve a game I call Pavio's Pendulum. And it usually involves a bolt on a piece of string, but people have used all sorts of things for this demonstration. So earphones uh, can work. Uh, I found uh, various items in our cutlery drawer or in our shed. And I'm hoping that I'll give you a bit of warning just to go and prepare something so you can play along with this game. And for the entire duration of this game, you're going to hold the pendulum out in front of you like this and you're gonna make no effort whatsoever to actually move it. It does move, so even as I'm standing here now, it actually is bobbing around, but I'm not gonna try and move it, and nor will you. And so that's basically the, the basis of where we start from. Notice that I will, and you will not put your elbow on the table. You want the arm to be out free, and so after a minute or two, that can start to ache. So don't start until we're actually into the instructions of the game. So this isn't a silly psychology attempt at kind of mass hypnosis and I'm wondering if it will work with everyone being in different locations but normally it works just fine. Um, so you'll hold the pendulum out in front of you, your arm unsupported, uh, you'll make no effort to move it and then we're going to do some mental imagery where we use our mind's eye to imagine the pendulum moving. So the first part of the exercise is when we imagine the pendulum moving from left to right. So if I was trying to make it move, it would be a big movement trying to get it to move around. But instead, I'm gonna create the clearest possible mental picture of that pendulum swinging uh, from left to right. I'm gonna focus on the pendulum. and I'm gonna think how would it look if I was moving it from left to right? And how would it feel in my arm? And how would it feel between my fingers if I was swinging it from left to right. And if I can make the clearest possible image and play it in real time, that's the first part of this activity. When we do that, I had some helpers with me working through that. Here is how that can look. Alright, so for the next part of the activity, as I said in the video, let's try and prove that that wasn't some kind of fluke. Now do a different mental image of how it would look if you were swinging it forwards and backwards instead. So it will look different in the way you imagine it, how it looks, and it will feel different in the muscles of your arm and the grip between your fingers. So try and pair up the full and complete Technicolor mental representation of how it looks and how it feels if you're moving that pendulum forwards and backwards instead. When we play that out in real time, this is what can happen. So we check the direction, so it's actually a new, completely new mental image, forwards to backwards instead. So you think a different picture, and different muscles, different between your fingers. But it's all about creating the strongest, clearest picture you possibly can, and then playing it in real time. No way, that's so crazy. The last version of this in this activity will be to imagine it going round and round in a circle. So let's imagine you're going clockwise. How would that pendulum look if you were swinging it round and round in a circle? It's going to be a different uh, type of movement, different feel in your muscles and arm, and a different feel between your fingers as you move it round and round in a circle. So create the clearest possible mental representation and play it in real time and really focus on that, even though you aren't trying to move it. Let's see what happens. So for sure that doesn't happen to everyone. I think about uh, between two thirds and three quarters of people will see the pendulum moving and it's doing exactly 
what they imagined it would do. So it's not moving around randomly, it's doing what you were thinking. So that's a crucial point. And we'll perhaps consider as these sessions progress why some people don't see the pendulum move at all. But for those that do, we have a couple of key questions. We need to be thinking, what's going on? What's the mechanism? You know, it should raise that question of what, how, why? So what's happening inside a person that would lead to simply thinking about a movement, making it happen? And if we're satisfied that there's a logical explanation for it, we could also stop and ask, well, what could that be used for? Is it simply a party trick or could it actually come in handy for sports, performance and exercise settings? So as we rejoin the tute, we'll be thinking about those questions. So the next activity, which I suspect you might not be able to do at home this time, is one that I call the floating poles game or sometimes also called the helium poles game. And I'll say from the beginning, it normally requires a large group of people. Um, I like to have at least six to eight people around one of the poles for this game to work. Um, and you'll notice that there are some simple rules around how we do this. So to begin with, we don't want, um, when people hold the pole, we don't want them to actually um, hook their fingers underneath it. We don't want them to put their thumbs on top. Just balance the pole and everyone gathers around it with their fingers underneath. And once we're in that position with the pole roughly at someone's sort of sternum height, we can then basically pursue two rules. And I'll have a room full of teams playing this game usually, and we'll have a race. But there's only two rules. First, to win the game, lower that pole down to the ground. Sounds easy. The second rule is never break contact with that pole. And so normally there'll be me and maybe someone who can't play because they've hurt their back or their hamstring or something. And so there'll be a couple of us policing this activity and making sure nobody's fingers break contact with the pole. And if they do, they have to go back to the beginning again. I'm gonna show you the version we did with the volunteers. And then I'll also link to a version where it's been done in other settings as well. I think we all going to go down. We're going to put it around. We're going Let's go, let's go. Let's go. Slightly bend the knees, slowly get the knees at the same time. demonstration worked reasonably well even though we only had a few volunteers and it only has two rules to the game really so I like to start when I'm working with teams by asking how many rules are in your game and of course usually there's very many some um, sports are particularly rule governed and very technical and um, this therefore gets them thinking around how they balance all the different rules they have to try and follow in much more complicated games. The activity itself can last quite a long time uh, if you have more people around the pole and if you actually really police the never break contact and make them conscious of that. And so you can really play on, this shouldn't have taken you so long, what do you think is going on? And of course, when you ask people what you think it's to demonstrate, they'll normally say things like leadership and teamwork and communication. So I'd like you to pause and think about why that game takes so long, especially if there's more people, especially if you really police the never break contact rule. And think about what things need to happen for that activity to succeed, especially when there's bigger teams, especially when you really police the never break contact rule. Um, so it's simple, something where you can do it in corporate settings, in sports teams, 
and it can really kind of um it it can take a few minutes it can take a chunk of time actually uh, and then people really get invested and want to succeed and you have to wait for them to finish even though you want to move on but i just want the group as a whole to stop and think about why doesn't that work why does it take so long and uh, what needs to happen for that activity to to work better so in our third activity we're going to play a game called the talking tree and it emphasizes one of the mental skills that we work with called self-talk. In pairs, so you might have someone who you live with or a friend at some point, in pairs, you simply have two people, one stands with their arms wide open and tries to resist as somebody else tries to push their arms down to their side. And the person with their arms rigid is the tree and the person pushing is the wind. And the person who is being a tree uh, will have two choices. Uh, throughout the game they should be either thinking very very helpful things like this is fine i feel strong i feel good i've been going to be here for ages i'm really good at this maybe i'm stronger than i thought really really helpful positive things or really really negative unhelpful things about the task like this is starting to hurt this is quite painful maybe i'm not as strong as i thought i'm gonna to have to stop soon those types of thoughts I like to try and stop and explain to people, let's not go as far as, uh, oh, I'm a bad person, I don't deserve to do well at this. It's just about the task. Either I'm really good at this, I feel strong, I feel great, or this is starting to ache, I'm going to have to stop soon. Um, it's only about the task. The person doing the pushing as the wind, trying to push the arms down, please don't sort of take a run up and jump on uh, your partner please gauge how much strength it takes to push their arms down because if you're reasonably similar sizes then it's just a matter of physics that you should have the advantage because you've got gravity and um, a, a lever to push on so you should probably get their arms down eventually but uh, just gauge it gauge how much strength it takes so everyone in this game does it twice everyone is the tree positive and negative and everyone gets to be the wind at some point and usually I just ask people, is there a difference? It's like it hurts. Size it's disadvantage here. <laughs> if you need to stretch further out, yeah. Very yeah. often. So I can't keep going with this. It's not uh, not easy. Yeah. So we're trying to get it to their size. Yeah. 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 You work out how much force you'll need to do. Where you go? <laughs> you can do it tight. You can do it. All right. Give me some time. Ready? Tight is strong, dude. Oh, All right. That one my arm. So as you can probably tell, we in that example, we used negative self-talk first and then positive self-talk the second time. And for most people, there's a profound difference between those two things. And what I'd like to try and emphasize is that in both the imagery activity and the self-talk activity, we're seeing physical differences, meaningful differences that you can observe in the real world just by thinking happy, helpful thoughts. So um, sometimes when people are a bit skeptical about psychology, these are good examples for showing people this makes a physical difference. And in the case of this game, a difference to your strength, apparently. So typically people feel and act stronger um, when they are being positive. 
Uh, there are a few exceptions. Some people actually need to get angry and it can happen sometimes that people use self-talk to get angry. But for the main part, again, about two thirds, three quarters of people will say they were stronger and the pusher will say they were stronger when they were being very positive inside their head. So just thinking happy thoughts makes us physically stronger, apparently. Uh, you can do the same thing simply by holding uh, two bottles of fluid out without anybody actually um, pushing and you can just time how long you last or you can adopt the um, classic ski hole position against a wall a wall squat where you sort of kind of um, just sit there and see how long you can last in that position and either way self-talk seems to also play a huge role in those and I've done those as big experiments before in classes so if we accept that there's a difference happening here just by the language we're using internally inside our head not externally then that should raise some more questions for us. Again, we should be able to ask, what's going on there? Why does that happen? How does that happen? And again, is it just a party trick or is it actually something that could be useful in sport? So when we go back into the group in a second, I want us to explore these answers and I will not be providing the answer. You'll have to be at least offering something to get the conversation going. So this next activity is one that I call goal ball. And it emphasizes one of the classic skills that we use in sports psychology called goal setting. And in this case, again, we're gonna be working in small teams and we're gonna have one minute to throw a ball in a bucket as many times as we possibly can as a team. Because it's a team activity, everyone must throw at least once and you always throw from behind one line and the bin always stays behind the other line. So these are quite sort of basic rules so far. Um, you set yourself a goal for how many shots you think you can make in a minute. That's one of the key things you do before you play. And then you record the number of actual shots that you score in that minute. So what we then end up with is a little bit of maths where you work out the difference between what your goal was and what you actually scored and you subtract the difference from your actual score so if my goal was 10 and I scored 5 I missed my goal by 5 so 5 minus 5 is 0 if my goal was 10 and I scored 15 I missed my goal by 5 so 15 my actual score take away those 5 puts me back on 10 so I've kind of capped what I could have possibly got in a class environment there is the overall goal of winning and getting the highest score there are they, that's highly dependent on the performance goal that you set which is the number as you can see at the bottom here I encourage people to think about their tactics and their process goals and to think about how they can get as many shots as possible within that minute uh, so for example how they return the ball back to the thrower um, maybe they need to think about who their favorite throwers are as a team things like that but there are tactics as well so you get outcomes performance level and tactics and processes all being illustrated within this game here's a couple of quick examples of the game playing out So in the first example, by my count, their goal was 10, they scored 8 shots and therefore their final score was actually 6 because they missed by they missed their goal of 10 by 2. 8 take away 2 makes 6.
So acknowledging there was a little glitch in the video there, I counted nine shots being made and their goal was still 10, so they missed by one. Nine, take away that one, means they scored eight. So in the final round of the activity, I set them a goal of 30. And I also strongly encourage them to think very hard about their tactics within the constraints of these rules. Everyone throws once, you throw from behind the line, the bin always stays behind the, the line and if it goes in front of it, the point doesn't count. And after a little bit of um, creative encouragement, we came up with the next scenario. So in the last round of the game, their goal was 30 set by me, and they actually scored 28, which uh, led to a final score of 26 because they missed 30 by two, 28 take away two is 26. There's a connection here, that would have been a much better chance of winning the overall game because it's a much higher score than they got before. They couldn't have scored more than 10 before by the nature of the rules of the game. So that would have given them a much better chance of winning in a class setting and it is itself an objectively higher score. The thing that really changed was the difference in tactics and process goals, and that required a little bit of creativity and a little bit of negotiation. And there are still ways I think you can further push beyond what was done in that video. But one thing I like to illustrate with that kind of fun, silly game is that goals are important, um, goals are connected, and as you may have observed, and as you certainly would experience if you ever play a game like this, it's actually quite motivating. First of all, it, it makes you sort of energised to do the thing in the first place. And second of all, if you ever hit your goal, or certainly if you achieve and win the overall game against the rest of the class, it's motivating, it's rewarding, it's satisfying. So there's something about goals which uh, may work, but the way we set them and the way we connect them from outcome to performance to process seems to be really important. The question, like it has been throughout the rest of this session, what's going on for something like goals to make people seem to become energized, motivated, and all these different things? And if it's more than just a kind of sort of simple, basic game, what could goal setting actually be used for? Is there any benefit to this or are we just wasting people's time? So the last activity in today's session is going to be one that I've called the power beacon. And rather than asking you how it works afterwards, I'm going to tell you how it works. It works by aligning your um, power channels and your aura and your chi. And it actually makes you stronger through that process. It makes you more balanced. It's a, a miracle. And it's really important that you understand it's all about aligning your chakra auras and it actually makes you physically stronger. Um, what can you use it for? Well, lots of athletes uh, use things like this. Um, some famous people use it. And um, if you don't believe me, let's try it out. Let's actually do this. I'll show you what happened with uh, the volunteers. And uh, in each time, the first example, I make them do the activity with no help whatsoever. And in the second example, we use a magical power beacon which looks surprisingly like a bicycle light, but I can assure you it's actually a power beacon that aligns your magical aura chakra things. Oh, 
was just like, what? <laughs> So they now I give each person the beacon and they pass it along the line. And I sometimes give them a few seconds to let the power of the beacon soak through their body and make them stronger and better balanced. So obviously that was incontrovertible evidence already. Um, when they were holding the beacon, it was making them stronger and better balanced. And my attempts to make them fall over by pushing on their outstretched arm were failing. When they were holding the beacon, when they weren't holding the beacon, they, were, they would fall over. So um, my question at this point in the presentation would be, how much would you pay for one of those? In the second version, which might be a more practical example, we imitate carrying a backpack and you can see the people the volunteers here stand with their hands behind their back and I push down directly into the palm of their hand and without the beacon they struggle actually it turns out they're not as strong as they thought and then when they have the beacon even near them even in their pocket it still makes them stronger so first run through no beacon see how strong they are <laughs> So here again, I pass them the red flashing power beacon and it changes their aura and aligns their chakras and suddenly they become stronger, which if you think about a sport is going to be incredibly useful. So at this point, I need to be very honest with you. I was genuinely pushing much harder in the second examples each time. And the volunteers involved, or anyone who does that experiment, will tell you they were able to resist more each time. So there you go. What is it about that that seems to work? So hopefully most of you by now are thinking maybe something different was happening in that example. And the kicker is, uh, I know that I was doing some showmanship and some cheating in that example. And I want you to think about whether it was good sports psychology uh, or whether something else was happening. Uh, would it be okay, for example, to give that power beacon to athletes and do the same example and say, now off you go and win the Olympics? 
or would that lead to all kinds of problems? So I want you to try and work out what you think I was doing to get that example to work. And then we can also start to untangle the difference between how we recognize good science in psychology versus how we recognize what you might call pseudoscience, um, unsound, strange, probably not true. And if we can separate sound science from unsound pseudoscience, that's a really good outcome for the first week's tube.